divine healing and health is a definite act of God through faith in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the precious blood of Jesus Christ, whereby the human body is cured, healed, repaired, delivered from sickness and its power, and made as whole, sound, and healthy as before the attack. And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? And forgetting that I was about to speak, I just began sobbing because I'd been nursing the thought that God was asking too much of me, you know, pain on top of quadriplegia. But that song, Blessings, wow, it put an end to that. So at my funeral, I want people to experience what I did that day that their hardest trials are really mercies in disguise. And they're mercies because they force us into the arms of Jesus where otherwise we might not be inclined to go. Welcome back to Venice Jennings Dake, worst study Bible ever made. So the first clip you have Finnis Dake himself saying that God will do whatever we want if we ask in faith. So he wasn't even just talking about being healthy, because in other places in his Bible he talks about being wealthy. So this is uh, heresy number five. Yeah, five. We're up to five now. And then the second clip was Johnny Erickson Tata, who was paralyzed uh, in a swimming accident way back in the 70s and struggled for many years to accept what had happened and to trust in God. And her entire ministry is premised on the idea that God does these things, either allows these things or causes these things. Whatever word you want to use, to draw us close to him. And that's what she says in her, in this video. Finishing in his dig believe that in no case did any kind of sickness glorify God. Because we cannot work for God. We cannot minister for God when we are sick as well as when we are healthy. And so he had no concept of of uh, spiritual affliction, of drawing close to God when things are difficult. Finnis Dick believes that our lives should be wonderful and prosperous, and that's what glorifies God. The scripture says that God afflicts us, that God causes these things, and that he does this for our good so that we seek him and so that we learn to trust him and do not trust in ourselves and do not trust in this life, and I've, I've said this before, this life is temporary. This life is nothing compared to what, we'll, what we have to look forward to in eternity. And Paul says the same thing. And so for God to make this life wonderful would completely take our eyes off, off our future, off our glory, uh, for for all eternity with him and so that that kind of thinking is very shallow and very ignorant and very immature um, anytime you have somebody who who tells you god wants you to be uh, materially blessed and um, healthy all the time they have no understanding of god of sin of a natural tendency to forget about god and ignore him when things are nice and when things are, are wonderful. And you can see it in, in America in that we're the most prosperous nation on earth, but we are the least spiritual. And all throughout the West, that's, that's a problem in that we are materially blessed, we are very healthy, and we don't know God at all. We, we indulge in our sin. We have nothing but time to to waste, to ignore God, to defy God. And when when we're 
healthy and when we're wealthy we forget about God because that's well that's who we are we're we're sinners we're fleshly we're ignorant we're stupid and we don't seek God without pain and God knows this and so God afflicts us with things and the Bible is very clear about this but Finnis doesn't like that and there's tons of verses okay Finnish energy take study Bible uh, page 1240, the entire 91st Psalm teaches perfect healing and health physically. So the salvation of verse 16 includes the body as well as the soul. Page 65, New Testament. God gets glory only in healing, not in the sickness. He may get glory out of some lives in spite of the sickness, but not because of it. Sickness should never be used as an excuse of glorifying God. One can glorify Him much better well than sick. Page 187. God does not get glory out of sickness, but out of healing the sick. God get, may get some glory in spite of some sickness, but the sickness itself is no glory. Anyone young or old can certainly glorify God better and do more work for him when well than when sick. Let no person be deceived in thinking he is sick for God's glory, for there is no scriptural foundation for such modern fallacy. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 talks about being buffeted by a messenger from Satan in order to glorify God. What does he say? I'll read the King James Version. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for men to utter. Such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I have besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, most gladly therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We talked about prosperity also. Uh, page 920, Old Testament, the doctrine of God supplying lawful wants as well as needs is taught in both Testaments. So God meets our needs and our wants. It's because in the verse that he's talking about is, I shall not want, which this is not what that means. It does not mean that I get everything I want. It means this is King James language. This is not uh, modern 20th century English language. When, when the Bible in, in 1611 says, I shall not want, it means I have everything I need. It doesn't mean I have everything I want. The wants and needs. Language changes over 400 years, Dake. And the word want doesn't mean the same thing as the word want today. Page 921, God created all things for his own pleasure and glory, that he might make, make himself known as by manifesting his goodness. It is therefore proper to use this as the basis of answered prayer. So God will answer all of our prayers in order to show that he's a good God. Page 929, the doctrine of no want to believers is one of mo the most clearest and most comprehensive declarations of scripture. In view of the simple and complete promises, the only excuse for not having every need and want met within the bounds of Scripture is unbelief and ignorance of truth. So, again, Dick is a very uh, literal guy, but he's not intelligent at all. And he cannot he cannot understand that because the word says want back 400 years ago means that. It doesn't mean the same thing that it means today. All right, one more example. 998, page 998, large print edition. Finish, Dake. He is talking about Psalm, let's see, Psalm 112, verse 3. 
Both in riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness shall endure. His righteousness endureth forever. He's talking about the upright. Here we have God's sanction of wealth and riches for the righteous men. How foolish to condemn riches and class rich men and wicked just because of their prosperity. Wealth is a blessing if used as God intended. It was God's original plan that all men be prosperous and use all things in creation for their own good and God's glory. It's still God's purpose and when the Messiah reigns, every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree, which indicates there will be universal peace and prosperity. So the Bible does talk about God blesses the righteous, but God also the Bible also says that God afflicts the righteous. So what does this mean? Well, there is a sense in which God blesses the righteous, but not because they're righteous, because they work hard, because they're diligent, and it says this in Proverbs a lot, because they take care of their money, and they're wise in their decisions, and they don't, um, like, there's a lot of warnings in, Pro in Proverbs about being a guarantor for somebody else's debt. And God blesses us in these ways, and because we know that not every Christian is prosperous. You can go to any country, any third world country, there are faithful Christians there, and they're not all wealthy. God has put in place the system, the the ideals that everyone, not just, and it's not just true for righteous people, but everyone who is wise, who manages their money, who works hard, who is diligent, will earn a good living. And this is like a general principle. Okay. It is not the same as saying God gives all the Christians whatever they want. It's retarded. So we're up to um, salvation by works, Pelagianism, sin is an evil spirit, sinless perfection, and we have health and wealth um, doctrine. This is very close to uh, the word faith belief that you create things with your words. But I don't think it goes that far, but it's basically the same thing in that everything God gives us everything we want if we ask by faith and in prayer. So those are the big five so far. There's one more major, well, yeah, there's one more major heresy that Dick manages to fit in this Bible, and that is open theism, which says that God doesn't know everything. Dick says that God learns things as they unfold in the world because he respects our free will. Someone wrote, how can God be everywhere at the same time? He isn't everywhere at the same time bodily, any more than you. Well, you're, you're quite well uh, everywhere around the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, but your body isn't in every one of these spots where we saw in the, the pens a few minutes ago. Yet your presence is felt in all these places every day. And if you look at it uh, sensibly then, God's body is not everywhere. So our last thing that is peculiar to this Bible, and there's there's a lot more if you guys want to look into this, is open theism. And Dick not only says that God doesn't know everything, so he's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He isn't everywhere at the same time. Dick says that he God has to move around from place to place, but he is originally from a planet called heaven. Okay, and he sits on an actual throne. And he says that God has a body that is made of spiritual substance. Now, this is a contradiction because spirit is not physical, but substance is physical. So he's just throwing words around that have no meaning. No meaning. He says that God has a personal body, a personal spirit, and a personal soul just because God says, God uses these, these languages. Okay, he uses these words in the Bible. He talks about his soul is troubled and stuff like that. That does not mean that he has a body, soul, and spirit. Okay, he's not like us. Jesus says in John 3 that God is spirit. Okay, and elsewhere says no man has seen God at any time. God is a spirit. 
You do not have a spirit body. There is no such thing as a, as a spirit body. Now let's read about the Omnibody. The Omnibody. Finish the idiot. We have many examples of God going place from place to place like other persons. Page 15. Page 24. Okay, this is talking about omniscience. God is not omniscient. And also this omnibody weirdness. Here we have proof that God receives knowledge of true conditions and becomes acquainted with existing facts. He's referring to Genesis uh, 18, 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of, of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. So he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. God uses his language to express himself, and not to say that he doesn't know something, but just that he's concerned. God wants to show that he relates to us, that he's concerned about our lives, about what's going on in his world, but not that he doesn't know what's going on. God has to express himself with our language. These these things don't literally mean that God does not know something. We know that God predicts everything. In Genesis 1, he predicts what's going to happen. In Genesis, uh, the late chapters of Genesis, he talks about Joseph, and he ordained the whole thing. Not only did he know what was going to happen, he caused everything to happen. Dake and men like Dake, they want God to be equal to them. They bring God down in order to elevate themselves. And it is not, it's not the Bible teaches these things. They, you have to twist a lot of scripture to say that God does not know everything, that he's an omnipresent, to say that a, a metaphorical passage is a literal passage. The Bible says that God is, he fills the whole earth. Okay, and if God has a body then his body is enormous and bigger than the universe. And there's nothing Dake says when God has to go from place to place, none of this makes any sense. And it's this Bible is just insane. I mean, the man had serious mental problems. Page 108, Exodus 3 9. Now, therefore, we hold the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. The word also proves that somebody besides God had seen and reported to him the oppression of Israel. That doesn't mean, also doesn't mean that there are two people that sees these things. It means that the two things that God is doing. He says, the, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. That's one thing. And I've also seen the oppression. That's two things. So, Dake was kind of a retard. There's uh, a few other things, at least one. Now, you guys know I'm a Calvinist. I believe that God chooses us without reference to anything that we have done, because we have not done anything that merits choosing. We are sinners apart from His grace. We are uh, dust. God calls us dust. Grasshoppers, uh, Isaiah 40. He says the nations are dust. So if the nations are dust, then what, what is each individual? But here is Dake's worst, one of his worst things that he said. Okay, completely contradictory. Where he's talking about Romans 9, where Paul says, God did not choose on anything that these children did. Right? Romans 9, 11, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. Paul literally spells this out. Not because of anything that they did. And so, Dick, of course, contradicts this completely. God hardens on the same grounds of showing mercy. If men will accept mercy, he will give it to them. If they were not thus hardening themselves, he is only just and righteous in judging them. Men are privileged to humble themselves and seek mercy or exalt themselves and refuse mercy. Mercy is the effect of a right attitude. Okay, so we receive mercy because we are good people. Hardening is the effect of stubbornness or the wrong attitude. So that's 
that's the old Pentecostal belief and the old Armenian belief the old uh, Pelagian heresy that God chooses good people but not bad people and there you have Finistake stupidest worst horrible study Bible ever created all the heresies you can imagine and more in one enormous book.